Good morning. I'm incredibly excited to be here this morning and lead in worship this morning. So sing with me as we sing to our God and sing to Jesus. I search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise and treasures fade on every Then you came along And you put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of You give me 
loves us that he would come into our brokenness into our broken world to demonstrate that love for us you know I, I wager that everybody here has at least heard or has memorized John 316 but what's so interesting about John 316 is that John is telling the story of Jesus and talking with Nicodemus and John interjects into that story with this verse. You see, John realized and was overcome with the love of Jesus in that moment, and, and he just had to put it in that story. He had to interrupt that story to let us know that God so loved us that he sent Jesus for us. So as we're singing this song, I just, I want it to be our, our prayer and just this realization that in our brokenness, when we feel unloved, when we feel hurt, when we feel like the world is closing in on us, that, that we have this assurance that Jesus loves us. Dear Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for interjecting into our story for putting Jesus into our story. That, that amazing interjection, the, the great interjection of Jesus into our story has changed our lives. And it's the realization of his love for us that, that draws us closer to God, that draws us closer to you, that, that brings us into relationship with you. That Jesus' love for us bridges the gap that sin has caused, that, that our selfishness has caused. And Jesus is the, the gap closer and, and the bridge into this relationship, this amazing relationship where we can feel the love that you have for us. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it with me, let it be your prayer. Jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy.
Well, it is so good to be with you today. If we haven't met, my name is Casey, and I'm one of the pastors here. And to those of you that are new with us, just a reminder to what we mentioned earlier, there's a Connect card that's located in the seat back of the chair in front of you. And before you leave today, would you go take that Connect card back to the welcome table? We'd have a, a gift for you being with us today, and we'd love to give that to you. Uh, for those of you that are joining us from Potter, and we're grateful to be with you today, and for those of you that we get to be with you in your home as you're watching online, we're so grateful to be with you. For those of us here, can we welcome those that are watching online and those that are new with us, will you do that with me? Yes. Uh, if you are new with us, we are in the series called Like a Good Neighbor. And we've been looking at this series and we're really taking a literal look at the command that Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he hitches the second greatest command. He says that in the second is like it. It's not the second greatest. It's actually, he says, it's equal to this, to love your neighbor as Yourself. And so this is what we are doing. We're asking, what would it look like to take Jesus literally and love our neighbors, our literal neighbors, as ourselves have been loved by God? I mean, what would it look like for you to love the people that live on the other side of the fence than you and, and or love the people across the street from you or love the people in your neighborhood, but love them in the way that Jesus has loved you? And, and, and it's not just to say, hey, you know what? Well, this is a suggestion. No, as Christ followers, this is not a suggestion. As Christ followers, as people who've been changed by Jesus, and Jesus says this is a command. <laughs> this is what is required. And so what we are looking at is what would it look like for us to take that command seriously and literally by practicing it with our literal neighbors. And we're discovering that, this, that as we do this, this is more about being the neighbor than looking for our neighbors. And it's about being the neighbor to our neighbors in need. And as we see ourselves as the neighbor, as we saw a couple weeks ago, and as we're making time for this, and, and as we're seeing Jesus in the people around us, we will be the neighbor. And this series, Big Idea, is what we're talking about. That we will be the neighbor positioned to bless. If you're new to the West Side culture, there's bless is an acrostic that we use quite regularly as we live out what it means to be on this mission together of loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing Jesus. That B stands for begin with prayer, that we want to ask God, where is he at work? And we're asking God, where are you working in our neighborhood? It's listening. It's not just listening to God through prayer, but it's listening to our, our neighbors. It's making the time to listen to them. It's about eating together, and that's the E. And one of the most spiritual things that you can do, one of the things that you can present, way that you can present the gospel to them is, is to a neighbor is just by sharing a meal with them. There's something powerful that happens. And then looking for the opportunities to that first S is serve, that we hope that as we do some of these things that God leads us to, that it will set us up or someone to set up, set up someone to share the story that you have about Jesus, the story of how Jesus has changed your life because your story contains Jesus' story. And that's the story that we all 
share. It's the story that we live from. It's a story that we live out. And last week, we talked about seeing Jesus in our neighbor and, and seeing Jesus in the lost and the last and the least. And here's something I want us to realize today, that when we see Jesus in our neighbor, we will invite them, welcome them, and serve them. That when you begin to see Jesus in your neighbor, this, you're going to not just invite them, because every, I mean, you, more than just the invitation, but you're going to invite people. But more than just the invitation, because you've invited a lot of people and you've been invited to a lot of people's homes, but as soon as you got there, you weren't welcomed. You've been invited to places or parties and, and, and the invitation was great, but the welcome wasn't. The invitation was great and the card looked beautiful and you thought to yourself, man, I'm important to be well invited, but nobody welcomed you when you got there. See, it's not just about the invitation, it's about the welcome that you received, but it's also taking it to the next level and serving and caring for those around us. See, this was a way of life. This was the lifestyle of the early disciples of Jesus. These first century disciples of Jesus, they, they, they invited, they welcomed, and they served their neighbors. And the reason they did this is this is the life that Jesus modeled. See, Jesus was constantly inviting people. He invited people to come and follow him. Every one of the disciples responded to an invitation that Jesus did, gave them that it changed their life. But not only that, Jesus invited himself to other people's homes. He would invite himself over to someone else's homes because he wanted to, he had something that he wanted to bring them into. And Jesus would not just invite people into his life and invite people to follow him. He would welcome them. He would accept them as they were. And Jesus would do something even greater. He would serve them. And here's the powerful thing. Jesus does this with you and me as well. See, Jesus invites you and I to follow him. Jesus, not only that, but he welcomes and accepts you as you are. And Jesus, through his life that he lived and his death that he gave on your behalf, he served you and invites you into something that is amazing, to be with him forever. See, Jesus invites us into his life. And I want you to understand this, that, that when Jesus invites you, he doesn't invite you just to a, a way of life. He invites you into his life. He invites you into something that he has that is amazing for you. And he invites you to come and, and, not, and, and to experience the life that he can give because he is the way, as we talked about. He is the truth as scripture, as he clarifies, and he is the life. And he invites you into a life more than you've ever experienced it before. But here's the beautiful thing <laughs> is he also invites you to live with him forever. And think about this. He loves you so much that he wants to spend forever with you. That's the invitation he gives and the art of inviting, the art of welcoming, and the art of serving that the, Jesus models to us and that the early church exemplified and they practiced is best known as hospitality. It's best defined as hospitality. See, biblical hospitality is a way of life for every follower of Jesus. Biblical hospitality is the way of life for you as a follower of Jesus. But something has happened in our understanding of hospitality is through the years and through the centuries, our version of hospitality has transformed and it's become less and less like the version of the biblical hospitality that scripture shows us and that Jesus modeled and that the disciples lived out. And when the disciples lived this out, you got to understand that when the disciples lived this out, it made the message of Jesus irresistible, that it changed the world because they lived out true Biblical hospitality. And our Western postmodern version of hospitality is much different from the ancient version and, and the one that, the, uh, that Jesus modeled and the disciples saw Jesus teach, they saw Jesus live out and that the disciples also lived out. And through the years, we've distorted the meaning and we have a distorted understanding 
of what hospitality is. And I want to help you see what it is today, but first let's see what it's not. See, biblical hospitality is not just having family and friends over to your house. See, that's not biblical hospitality. Biblical hospitality is is not inviting over just those you're most comfortable with. See, our Western world has turned hospitality into inviting and welcoming and serving those with whom we are most comfortable to have in our home. But biblical hospitality is not that. And see, we like to do this and and we like to invite our friends and, and those we like the most over to our place because we're most comfortable. And then we like to toot our own home and say, hey, we, I have the gift of hospitality. I love to entertain. I love to do all of this. And that's the other point. See, biblical hospitality is not entertaining. We think it is. We think hospitality is entertaining people. But you know what? In the early church, biblical hospitality was not entertaining. This is something that transitioned around the 1700s. If you read church history, you'll, you'll learn that it's a, it wasn't until the 1700s that hospitality began to shift into entertaining people. And you know why? Because people saw that you could, you could show hospitality and it could leverage something for you in return. And they began to use this politically to get policies in place, to, to, to gain, to politic in organizations or politic at a social level. They use this for personal gain. See, up till this point, the Christians, the Christ followers in, in, in our Christian history, they, and, and even culture itself, had a moral, saw this as a moral obligation, saw practicing hospitality as a moral obligation, and specifically practicing it with those who were strangers. See, we call it hospitality when we invite someone over, impress them with our spread and our service. And the reason is, just to be realistic with, with you and probably the reason I've done it most of the time, because we want something in return. I mean, the reason that you invite people over to the birthday party is really you want to throw a better birthday party than what you saw on Facebook or Instagram. And you want people to like your post and, and like what you did. And there's a selfish, the selfish return that we want out of the things that we do for others. But biblical hospitality has no return value. There's no seeking a value in return. It's not about creating an Instagram post that goes viral or getting Facebook likes that, and setting a trend. It's not about that. And, and, and for some people that return, we've seen this even go to the corporate world, that some of the most hospitable organizations are corporate and you know the reason they're so hospitable it's because they want to return they want your business they want a client and sales what do we do we go and i've done this we take someone out hoping to solidify a sale and we're hospitable we treat them well it's something that we get a return. Maybe it's for a lead. Maybe it's, maybe it's even on a personal level that we're just trying to make a friend or we want popularity or we want them to give to an organization or give to a cause. See, sometimes we do it, a lot of times we entertain and that entertainment is more selfishly driven for what we get out of it. But biblical hospitality was not motivated by what would be returned. And also biblical hospitality is not based on our resources. See, your time and your money that are limited and you go, man, I can't do that because I don't have the extra time. I don't have the extra resources. I don't have the excess in my life that some of these rich people do have in their life that they can do all of this entertaining. They can do all of this hospitality. And what we do is we give ourselves a pass that we don't have to practice that because we don't have. And, and it, biblical hospitality is not based on our resources, and we cannot excuse ourselves from being hospitable because we don't have the means. We can't make excuses that only those that are rich who have the means can do this because Scripture shows us in the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, this is a, this is a, a reoccurring model of what hospitality is, that it wasn't through the rich uh, the, those who have, and it's not in what they had, but it was what they were generous and willing to give. See, that's what made them hospitable. We see stories from Abraham, how he was, he would show hospitality to strangers at a city gate. We, we read stories about a widow in the Old Testament as she would uh, uh, bring a prophet in and she only had enough oil for one last meal with her son. 
And then through practicing hospitality, giving generously with what she had, inviting someone into her home, her meager little home, that God blessed her for days because God is a greater giver. And God, we will discover today, is the greater hospitable host. And in this, he invites you and I to practice a hospitality that we don't understand and we've distorted the meaning of. See, hospitality is not, it, it, it's not using what you have for a selfish benefit. See, hospitality is using what you have for the selfless benefit to others. The first century church, they knew this. And to the first century disciples who would take the, this command not just as a suggestion, but they would take this command to love your neighbor as yourself, that they would love their neighbor in the same way Jesus has loved them. And what they would do is they would turn their home into a hospitality. See, they would turn this into a hospitality. And what they would do is they would take care of the orphans. When, when society was in their selfishness, rejecting the, the kids because of the burden it was on, and they were doing this in the masses, it was the Christians in the first century that would bring in them, bring these kids in, into their homes and begin to practice hospitality. See, biblical hospitality is a way of life for a disciple of Jesus because we take the command of Jesus seriously to love our neighbor as ourselves. To love our neighbor as ourselves has been loved by God. And this, I want you to know, Jesus takes it personal. Jesus takes it personal to him when we welcome a stranger, meet a need, and care for the sick. When the first century church um, took what Jesus said and, and seriously meant what he said and put it into practice, Matthew, um, it would, they, they, they would put this into practice. And what they did is they took Jesus' words that Matthew recorded seriously. And we talked about this last week when, when we were talking about the lost, the last, and the least and seeing Jesus in them. And in Matthew 25, see, the first century church took this passage seriously, and they took this, and they made this the model of, pra of practicing hospitality. And they didn't do it because they were trying to earn something from God. They did it because of what God had already done as the greater host coming and as, as sending Jesus to serve us. This was their response, and they took this so seriously because they knew Jesus took it personal when he said, for when I was hungry, for I was hungry, and you, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you were the one to come visit me. See, this is what the early Christians would call practicing hospitality. And we're going to see why they want you to, they, th th this was a term that they said, we will practice hospitality. See, they would see Jesus in the hungry, in the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the mistreated. And what they would do, they would show their love for Jesus by loving their neighbor as themselves. Because you cannot love God, Jesus said. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength without loving your neighbor as your Self, And they would see Jesus in those who were strangers. They would see Jesus in those who were underserved. And they would see Jesus in those who were mistreated. And because they took this seriously, they took this not as a suggestion, but as a command, the gospel message of Jesus was irresistible. And the church was irresistible. And in a culture today where they want to reject our message, in a culture today where they want to reject us as a church, I think we need to leverage what this ancient people understood as the way of life of a Christ follower. And let's make the gospel of Jesus irresistible again. Why? Because hospitality is central to sharing the good news of Jesus that has saved us. Hospitality is the central way that biblical hospitality has become a timeless metaphor of how God invites you in, welcomes you into his family. And even though we were strangers to him, we were the lost, we, we, were, we were mistreated, and, and maybe we were underserved, he's the one that stepped out. 
and cared and served us. See, biblical hospitality and practicing hospitality is a picture of how Jesus cares for us when we were the ones in need. When we didn't deserve his care, he served us. When we couldn't return anything of value or repay anything back to him, we can't give anything back to God that he needs from us, but yet he still loves us and serves us. See, this is being the neighbor that Jesus modeled and taught. This is being the good neighbor, like the good Samaritan in that parable. This is what it means to do that, to practice hospitality with the mistreated, the stranger, and the underserved. This is loving our neighbor as ourself has been loved by God. So here's the teaching big idea that I hope that you take as a challenge today, that it's just not gonna be a challenge as a suggestion, that you'll say this is a way of life, that my home is the place to practice hospitality, that you'll believe this today, that not just believe it in your head, that you'll put this into practice as, and we can join what the early church did and we together in Leavenworth and Lansing and Leavenworth County and for wherever you're watching at home today, that we can take this and we can make this a practice that makes the gospel of Jesus irresistible again by turning our homes into places of hospitality. See, being a neighbor is using your home and your resources to practice hospitality. So what is then true hospitality? We've defined what it isn't, but let's see what it is and who it's for. See, and we need to look at today, what is the best way and what is the way that we can do this so we can make Jesus irresistible again? Well, hospitality is this. It is inviting and welcoming in strangers and the underserved. These are the people that we need to show hospitality. These are those to whom we need to open our homes to, the strangers and the underserved. And I understand as soon as I say this, that you recognize the same thing I recognize, that this is hard because society and culture has taught us a lot about avoiding the strangers, those unlike you, keeping a distance from them. And, and, and seeing the underserved and being cautious in this. But the first century church, they saw what Jesus would teach and they would take him serious, that they would welcome in the underserved and the, the strangers. And they would not just do that, they would invite them and welcome them in and they would serve them. They would serve those who were hungry. They would serve those who were hurting and who couldn't help themselves. Why? Because this is what Jesus modeled and what Jesus taught. See, Jesus taught that these are the people we invite, not our family and our friends, those who can repay us. He said, look at the underserved. And we see this in in Luke chapter 14. And this is a very crazy encounter because imagine yourself inviting Jesus to a big banquet that you're throwing. And you want Jesus to be there because you know that something he's doing something great and you want him to be at your place. And you don't, for whatever reason, you want him there and, and you throw this big spread and all of a sudden you're the host and Jesus says this to you just like he said this to the very host that invited him to this one banquet. He looks at his host and says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. Now, I can't imagine but to think that maybe that was who was at that banquet. This is speculating, but can you imagine the awkwardness of Jesus saying this? Because I know that's who I would have probably invited. I mean, I would love to have invited you, my family and my friends, and those who had something of great wealth. And he says, if you do, look at this, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, you will be blessed. And this word blessed is not just, hey, you're going to get things in in material. This is not anything about material gain. You know what this blessing is? (laughs) This is the state of being that you will be in a place of happiness. And I don't know what you're searching for today. Maybe you're searching to fill a void. 
But maybe just taking Jesus' words seriously and practicing this command to love your neighbor as yourself and you doing it the same way that he would exemplify practicing hospitality here is not inviting those that can repay you or do something for you. But maybe the significance and purpose in your life is living your life selflessly. And when you live your life selflessly for the underserved, hmm, maybe that true happiness that you're looking for will be found only when you live the way that Jesus wants you to live. You will be blessed. And he goes on to say, although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus reminds you and I that this is not our home. He reminds you and I that there is a greater invitation that he has extended to you, that if you put your trust in him, he welcomes you into his family. He makes you a part. He invites you into his life so much that he wants to spend the rest of life with you. See, there's a blessing in that being with Jesus. See, who are the underserved in your neighborhood? Who are the ones that, that, that might be underserved, that are hurting and, and that are poor and, and, that, and you might live in a wealthy area, but maybe there's someone there who's just lost a job or maybe there's someone there who has been looked over. See, it's easy to invite our friends and our family over, but what do we do? What about looking at those that are outside? What about showing hospitality and inviting them in and welcoming them into our home? For those of you that might live in, a, in an area of town that you can't wait to move out of, because of the, it, it's in, a, in, in an area of how, a town that is underserved. What if you saw that God has placed you there to be a light by showing hospitality to the underserved people around you, that God has placed you there? And it's not about you having the re- resources or not having the resources of those in another neighbor, neighborhood. It's about you saying, God, you placed me here. You've given me a home. You've given me, and I'm just going to be generous with what I have with those around me who are in need. What about looking at those and and, and serving those who are hurting in your neighborhood? What about those who are sick? What about the elderly in your neighborhoods? What about those in your neighborhoods who who may need an invitation? Maybe they can't come out of your home, but maybe you can do what Jesus did and take that invitation. You invite yourself over to their home and say, you know what? Hey, I know you can't get out of the house, but can we bring our family over to your home for dinner? I've done this with my neighbor. She couldn't get out of the house and we brought our family over and we cooked pizza from Domino's. (laughs) Don't judge me. (laughs) But you know what we did? We invited her into our life by bringing our life into her home. What if you looked at the hurting in your neighborhood, the underserved, And you saw the home as the hub of what Jesus wants to do through you to show others what the goodness he has already shown you. See, it's it's serving the underserved and it's hospitality is using your home for the strangers. These are those who are unlike you. And the early church, they took this seriously when Jesus said the strangers. These were the people because they saw themselves as strangers to God, that God came to them when they were strange. They were not like Jesus. And here's the interesting thing about Jesus. See, Jesus came to those that were most unlike him and those that were most unlike Jesus. You know what? Jesus liked them and they liked him in return. And Jesus welcomed the stranger the one who was strange to him. And Jesus welcomed you and me. And the early church knew this. And they practiced hospitality with strangers. And they took this serious. This was a kingdom way of life. Look what the Hebrew writer would say. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, don't forget what you've received, the writer says. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and all. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. The writer saying this is how we respond to a God who has given us a kingdom, given you a kingdom of life and all of him is yours. And this is how you respond to this all powerful God. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. Why would he write, don't forget? You know why? Because they, like me, and likely like you, often forget that we need to show hospitality to those who are stranger than us. 
those who are strange to us. And it's not just the one who comes into your neighborhood that, that is just passing through. That's, the, that's one of the ways that we read about the stranger. But it's also the person who is unlike you, the culturally unlike you. What would it look like you for to, you to welcome them, invite them in, and serve them? Use your home f- to welcome the stranger. And, and then he goes on to say, that for so doing, by so doing, some people have shown hospitality, hospitality to angels without knowing it. What would it look like to show hospitality in your neighborhood to those who are strange to you? That those to unlike you, what would it look like to not forget them? See, sometimes we forget those that are unlike us and we like to put barriers. And what if we tore those down by inviting them in? See, we can forget that this is what Jesus did for us, but we must not. So we remind ourselves by practicing this with others, we must show hospitality to those who are unlike us. Also, hospitality is caring for those who suffer and are mistreated. That this is about the hurting, those who are sick, those in your area that need care for and, 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 and they, they, they're suffering. And in their suffering, you can reach out to them. They're, I love how we, we see people practice hospitality when someone has a new baby and their life is changed upside down, that you'll rally around them and bring meals. Or someone loses a loved one, you'll rally around them and bring meals. I've heard of you doing this with, with life groups, doing this with neighbors, and they, they don't even know who that neighbor is but because of the neighbor, they rally around that person. Or they have a surgery, they rally around and they care for the sick. What if we did that in our neighborhoods? Because I know this, if we do it in our neighborhoods, we'll do it outside of our neighborhoods. What would, we, what would happen if we literally took this, not as a suggestion, but as a command that we must be the ones to care for them, that we will see them, invite them, and welcome them in and care for them. The writer of Hebrews reminds the readers about those who have suffered also unjustly, that those who are mistreated and, and they suffer un, unjustly and they suffer injustice. And in this day and, age, j, day and age, the Christians were suffering unjustly and being put in prison. You know why? Because they believed in Jesus and were doing good. And they, 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 you read the stories in the history books and they had no other reason to put them in prison than other that they were worshiping a God that the government didn't endorse. And they would put them in prison. And in this This is what the Hebrew writer would say. Continue to remember. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Who are those in your neighborhood that are suffering unjustly? Maybe it's someone of a different race and, and they're suffering unjustly what would it look like for you to welcome them in? To make your home is is a home of hospitality. See, this is exactly what they would call their houses in this day and age. The early Christians were labeled as they would, their houses were houses of, quote, hospitality. And these houses of hospitality took in those who were mistreated unjustly. And they would care, they would even go and take care of those who were being treated unjustly. And they would invite others in. What would it look like to invite those over to look for them and invite? They are the ones, the ones that are hurting, the ones who are stranger, the ones who are underserved, and they're the ones that we invite in to watch the game instead of our best friends. Or we invite them with our best friends. What a better way to show them hospitality. And we include them. We invite them to the neighborhood barbecue. We invite them into our home to be with us. See, hospitality is serving those who can do nothing in return. See what happens in my life, and maybe this is what happens in your life, is really at the bottom of the whole thing and the, what, where it comes to the, when the rubber meets the road, it's really my selfishness that gets in the way. Isn't it? I mean, maybe that's only with me, but a lot of times it's my own selfishness that keeps me from showing hospitality to others. See, we shouldn't let selfishness keep us from following Jesus. We should selflessly share our life with those who cannot repay us. This is why Paul would, in the gospel to Rome, as a part of the response of the good news of what Jesus has done for us, this is what he would say in response to that gospel. He would say, be sincere in your love. Love is sincere. And you know what a sincere love is? It's not selfless. And this is how he would describe what that sincere love is. 
Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. And look what he would say here. Practice hospitality. This is a directive. This is not a suggestion, by the way. This is not something you can just say, why well, he's suggested. No, no, no. He says, you, because of the, what Jesus has done for you, practice hospitality. You know why he said practice? Because we aren't naturally good at this. This is an art to develop. This is something that you aren't just, there are gifts of hospitality and people have these gifts of hospitality, but every one of us need to learn the art of hospitality and we learn it by practicing it just like we would an instrument. We practice hospitality and we may not be good, but we can practice it. And it's not about being good. It's about practicing it because Jesus did this for us and this is what we need to do in response. See, hospitality is an art that needs to be practiced in our homes. It, we're great at practicing it in the church building. We're great at practicing it at work. We're great at practicing it at the party that we're helping another person throw. But see, it's about taking our homes, what we've been given, where we live. And you go, Casey, I just live in a meager apartment. Or I live in a dorm room at school. I don't care. Jesus doesn't care. He says, use what you have. And scripture shows us to practice hospitality. And there's something powerful when we use our homes. See, we are supposed to practice hospitality, not just with unbelievers, but we're supposed to practice hospitality with believers and unbelievers to share the story of Jesus. See, the reason that this needs to be practiced is because this is a command to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we do this regardless if our neighbor is a Christ follower or not. We are supposed to practice hospitality with unbelievers and believers. Why? Because we share the gospel with those who are unbelievers through our hospitality. And we remind those who are believers of the gospel through our hospitality. And when we practice hospitality, we are following Jesus because Jesus commanded us to love others in the same way we ourselves have been loved by God. And this ethic of the first century church is what they lived. This was a keystone habit that they would use. And because they lived this out, the gospel of Jesus spread around the world. And they would take this so seriously. Writers, disciples like Peter would write, and he would write things like this, that the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober mind, of sober mind so that you may pray. And above all, look at this, above all, love each other deeply because, why? Love covers a multitude of sins. This is the gospel of Jesus that Jesus' love covers the multitude of man's sin, of humanity's sin. And look exactly what he says next. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. See, hospitality is stewarding the good grace of God given to you. That's what hospitality is. This is what the early church did. This is why they were called houses of hospitality. <laughs> and these houses of hospitality that, that non-Christian historians would write about, they would say it was made the gospel of Jesus irresistible as these houses of hospitality were the ones, these Christians would take their homes and, and they would collect all the, the children who were left and, and, and that not being cared for for whatever reasons. And they would bring those orphans into their homes and they would care for them. Much like many of our families, our foster families, and they take care of practical homes. You are a home of hospitality, which is a demonstration of the good news of Jesus. See, these houses of hospitality in the first century church, they would do this so much that they wouldn't just, they would care for the sick. They would bring the sick into their home, just like the good Samaritan would care for, but they would make it personal. They would bring it in their home and they would do for them because they saw Jesus in the hurting. They saw Jesus in the broken. They saw Jesus in the naked. They saw Jesus in the sick. They bring them into their home. And so much that it got to where they had to build bigger homes and bigger homes for those who are hurting. And they became hospitals 
houses of hospitality. See, what the church did has changed the world. And I believe that the irresistible gospel of, can do it again when we take the ancient art of hospitality seriously. See, when we begin to help the underserved, the mistreated, and the stranger. See, hospitality is treating others. And this is the final thing. It's treating others just as our heavenly host, our host in heaven, invites us, welcomes us, and cares for us. See, this is what Jesus has done for you. He invited you. He welcomes you into his family. He cares for you just as he is your family. And he invites you to live with him forever. He is the greater host. And because Christians took this seriously, the good news of Jesus spread around the world. Because they didn't take this as a suggestion, but they took this as a command, the church was in its best form. <clears throat> See, the first century church used their homes, <clears throat> excuse me, they used their homes and the gospel of Jesus was shared around the world. I want to ask you today, what could God do if we said we're going to break down our Western view of our homes and use our homes the way the first century disciples did? What if we would use our homes? See, I believe if we use our homes, the gospel of Jesus will be shared around your neighborhood with your neighbors. As we practice this and we use our homes to practice hospitality. Why? Because this is what Jesus has done for you. This is what Jesus has done for me. And I know it can be overwhelming. I know that you might think, Casey, where do I, you know, what if we just did for one what you wish you could do for all? What if you focused on one who is a stranger to you? What if you focused on one who is underserved or one who is mistreated in your neighborhood and you began to practice that with them? Will you pray for the courage to use your home or where you live as a place to join Jesus and let's make the gospel message of Jesus irresistible.